Today's video is kindly sponsored by Policy Genius. Hey, 42 here. Imagine this. You wake up one morning to discover you've run out of coffee. That alone might sound like a plot for a horror story, but things are about to get worse. You start walking to the corner shop to stock up on your mocha java when you notice the world around you is in total chaos. Cars are crashing into buildings and each other. Broken electricity wires spew sparks in all directions. People are wandering aimlessly around the streets, wailing at the top of their lungs. You try to help an old lady nearby and discover she's blind. You try to help another person and realize he's blind too. In fact, everyone around you has gone blind overnight. As if that wasn't enough, you soon learn you're sharing the world with seven foot tall carnivorous plants, intent on extermination of the human race. With deadly stingers, the ability to walk, and the power to make decisions and communicate with each other, they seem like a very human enemy. It's not long before the plants are dominating the planet and humanity is on the brink of extinction. You haven't felt this kind of hopeless since waking up on a Monday after a four-day techno festival. Though I'd love to claim this story as the product of my own fertile imagination, it actually belongs to author John Wyndham, who wrote The Day of the Triffids. Triffids, the murderous semi-sentient plants in Wyndham's novel, may have seemed like a far-fetched fantasy when he published his book in the early 1950s. But the idea of conscious plants wasn't totally new. As far back as ancient Greece, trees were said to deliver prophecies, whilst in the late 1800s, Darwin suggested that plants may have some sort of intelligence, with their root tips acting in a similar way to the brain of lower animals. In the 1970s, a sensational book called The Secret Life of Plants claimed to show scientific evidence for the existence of plant consciousness, including plant emotions. When the book got panned by the scientific community for being pseudoscience, research in the area largely died away. But in the last 20 years or so, it's resurfaced. According to some of the latest findings, plants may have intentions, feelings, and even something we might tentatively call consciousness. Life insurance gives you peace of mind that if something happens to you, your loved ones would have a financial cushion to pay for things like rent or mortgage payments, loans, education costs, and everyday expenses. So Policy Genius makes it easy to compare quotes from over a dozen top insurers all in one place, meaning you could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. And that's because the licensed experts at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies. So you can trust them to help you navigate every step of the shopping and buying process. That kind of service has earned Policy Genius thousands of five star reviews across Trustpilot and Google. So, how does it work? Well, first you need to head over to www.policygenius.com forward slash 42 and answer a few questions about yourself. Then, in minutes, you can work out how much life insurance coverage you actually need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. Then, when you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius licensed experts will help you understand your options and apply for a policy. Head to www.policygenius.com forward slash 42 to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Many of the scientists exploring these theories are connected to the rather new and still very controversial field of plant neurobiology. This field aims to understand how plants process environmental information in order to grow, flourish and reproduce. It also studies how communication occurs within the plant itself, between one part of the plant and another, and how plants communicate with each other. These communication systems may provide the basis for abilities like cognition, learning, and consciousness. I know for some of you, it might feel as though someone's attaching a car battery to your nipples every time I apply the word consciousness to plants. There's no doubt it's a shocking idea, and the subject is certainly pretty controversial. 
We still don't have a particularly good handle on what our own version of consciousness is, so attempting to apply that term to other animals, let alone plants, is always going to be tricky. Definitions as to what exactly consciousness is in the first place vary wildly depending on whether you're talking to a philosopher, a cognitive neuroscientist, an atheist, a Buddhist, or that guy in town who talks to lampposts. But for the purposes of this video, let's just go with the dictionary definition. That consciousness is the state of being aware of internal and external phenomena, with the potential to experience thoughts and emotions and make decisions. Traditionally, it's been assumed that consciousness is only really possible where there's some sort of brain and nervous system involved. But plants don't work that way. If plants had a centralized control center, like our brain, then any grazing animal or hedge trimmer could come along and suddenly lop it off. For this reason alone, it makes evolutionary sense that plant consciousness if it does indeed exist, would be decentralized. Up to 90% of certain plant root systems can be removed and they're still able to regenerate. This idea of a distributed control center is part of the reason why. Darwin was quite literally on point with his thinking here. Every root tip has a tiny part responsible for conducting electrical signals the same type of signals found in human neurons. Each one of those root tips can continuously detect and monitor various physical parameters of the soil around it, and at least 15 different chemicals. But where does all that data go? Recent studies suggest that information moves through plants in a surprisingly familiar way. Animal nerve cells communicate with each other using an amino acid called glutamate. Once this substance is released by a stimulated nerve cell, it sets off a chain reaction in nearby cells in the form of a wave of calcium ions. This process continues from cell to cell and allows for the kind of long distance internal communication that tells your brain your nipples are attached to a car battery. Again. Plants don't have nerve cells as such but their cells are also able to communicate with one another using calcium and glutamate, something that's been shown experimentally in mustard plants, where damaged leaves send signals to other leaves. Whether this is some kind of an internal warning system, a pain signal, or something else entirely, we aren't quite sure. So, it seems internal plant communication functions in a very similar way to that of animals, but what about external communication? Is that even a thing in plants? We all know plants are masters of attracting insects using the sweet smell of nectar. The scent is a timeless classic in the insect world, a bit like Old Spice in the 70s. But it turns out plants also use electric fields to communicate with pollinators, releasing targeted bursts of scent when they detect, for example, the electrical field of a nearby bee. If plants are chatting with insects, can we assume they're also communicating with other plants? Well, let's start with the obvious bit. Plants don't have mouths or vocal cords to form sound and words, and simply shaking their leaves is hardly an effective mode of communication. As anyone who's ever worn a shell suit will tell you, rustling is very difficult to control. In the early 80s, two studies were published, theorizing that sugar maples, poplars, and willow trees were able to warn one another of insect attacks. The experiments found that trees near those infested with pests started to produce large amounts of insect-repelling chemicals to thwart the attacks before they could begin. It seems those trees somehow knew their neighbors were under siege and started arming their metaphorical battlements even though the enemy hadn't actually arrived yet. The papers were dismissed at the time, but further research has revealed they were actually onto something. It's now an accepted fact that when plants are eaten, they release chemical distress flares in the form of volatile organic compounds, and that nearby plants detect those signals and respond accordingly. There's no denying that's communication of a sort, 
and it proves plants do more than just passively exist. They react to a changing environment, which could be interpreted as an indication of consciousness. But the real question we have to ask is, is this communication intentional? or just an automated, involuntary release of chemicals that's evolved as a simple Darwinian survival mechanism. Well, like my ex-girlfriend said when I caught her looking at nude pictures of Papa Smurf, it's complicated. Scientists are only just starting to learn how to decode the signals that plants emit. But one recent study of sagebrushes noted that airborne communication using volatile compounds was more effective amongst plants that were more closely genetically related versus plants that weren't. Some scientists believe this suggests plants are looking out for their own, so to speak. If you think the idea that plants believe their sap is thicker than water is just scientists erroneously assigning plants human qualities, then you're not alone, but more on that later. If you've watched my video about the magic mushroom that will save humanity, you'll know there's more to plants' communication than just whispers on the wind. What's going on in the earth itself is even more complex. Using root systems and subterranean fungal networks, trees are able to communicate with one another and even send water and nutrients to other trees in need. These include their own offspring. Saplings not yet tall enough to reach the sunlight necessary for photosynthesis. It's a bit like leaving home as a teenager, but still getting lasagna from your mum because she's worried you're not eating well. Amazingly, some stumps of trees fell hundreds of years ago are still alive today thanks to the nutrients they receive via this underground network. The relationship between fungi and trees is estimated to be around 450 million years old, and 90% of trees are said to take advantage of it. Messages are composed of hormones, chemicals, and even electrical pulses, with the most popular topics of underground plant-based conversation related to things like disease and drought. So, it seems plants can respond to their environment and communicate possible signs of consciousness. Taking things a step further, how about intelligence or even memory? One rather clever, if somewhat brutal experiment using mimosas appears to show that plants have both memory and the ability to learn. Mimosa plants are famous for curling up their leaves when disturbed. So, as part of the test, potted mimosas were dropped from a few inches above the ground. The first time, the fall was enough to cause all the plants to close their leaves as expected. But from the second and third drops, some of the plants were no longer reacting. After having been dropped in this way dozens of times, none of the mimosas were attracting their leaves anymore. Just like humans and other animals eventually filter out stimuli that isn't important, it seems the mimosas had decided a small drop was nothing to worry about. Skeptics suggested the plants were simply tired from being dropped onto solid ground over and over again. A reasonable observation, if you ask me. But when the experiment was repeated with the same plants a week and then a month later, they reacted in exactly the same way. They didn't curl up their leaves in response to being dropped. Meaning, mimosa plants are not only able to recognize the difference between an apparent threat and a real one, they can remember that difference for at least a month. By way of contrast, honeybees, who are able to memorize locations, are seen as a model animal for studying learning and memory, but they only have a long-term memory of up to nine days. Emerging studies on plants seem to show the possibility of intention, intelligence, memory, and learning. All elements of what people would typically call consciousness. But many mainstream scientists think the field of plant neurobiology is a pile of compost. One group of 32 experts recently published an attack on the idea that plants possess intelligence, declaring everything can be explained by natural selection. 
They say humans are incurably inclined to believe in the myth of thinking, feeling, and sentient trees. I'm looking at you, Tolkien. And that the research has been anthropomorphized. That is, everything has been interpreted in terms of human characteristics, which, in reality, simply don't apply to plants. Given the fact that new discoveries are happening all the time, and there's so much we don't yet understand about plants, it looks like it will still be some time before we know for sure whether or not our gardens are conscious. Of course, unless you're a vegan who's paranoid about being resigned to a diet of soil for the rest of your life, that might not matter very much to you. But I, for one, will be keeping an eye on those leafy bastards. Just in case. Thanks for watching.